So attempting to build a double side band transceiver is not trivial. You might remember uh, Peter Parker VK3YE uh, with his Beach 40, which was a transceiver that he developed uh, piece by piece. And many people have attempted to reproduce that transceiver, some successfully, some not so successfully. You obviously have to have some RF skills to be able to build something even that simple. Uh, the way I look at this, results will vary based on your experience. So as I dig deeper into the transceiver and develop each stage as I go, I have to keep in mind the, uh, the balance between simplicity, you know, sheer number of parts. We're talking about component count here and the practicality of the circuit, the buildability, the stability of the circuit. And I think I want to develop a circuit board for whatever I come up with. So there's a little extra work that's going to go into this in order to develop a circuit board and perhaps to make it available to the community. And I'm thinking of doing something that uh, uh, might be something to help my channel out too. So we'll see what I can do as far as circuit board development. Uh, I've got my old uh, classic uh, homebrew dynamic microphone here. I got this out, but we recognize that uh, anything like this small portable DSB transceiver is going to require mobile microphone. And I found probably the cheapest one I could find online. This Chinese microphone is truly uh, low end. We'll see if we can make this work with the transceiver. I think I paid twelve dollars for this. Another thing I'm interested in is discrete components. I want to future proof the design. That means no integrated circuits or, or keep it very low on the integrated circuits. All ordinary transistors you know that you're recognizing the, the, uh, the typical NPN Transistors with an FT of 400 or greater will work for this. And uh, also, uh, how did I name it? I named it, you know, kind of uh, looking at Peter, I wanted to give him some credit here. Um, you know, I was, I was entertaining names like uh, uh, perhaps the Son of Beach, but I don't think... Uh, Son of Beach would be something that YouTube would, would accept. And then I was thinking of like the, the, the Peter Parker 10 or the Micro PP. The Micro PP I don't think would work either with YouTube. So I settled, you know, I settled on the Novice 10. This is a 10 meter transceiver, by the way. Uh, you're going to need a little more gain on 10 meters, so some of you will be disappointed. Uh, there's a little bit more complexity here because we need extra gain to work on 10 meters. But I can report that I'm getting very good results as far as sensitivity goes, and hopefully the amplifier won't be uh, too bad to develop. So here it is, part two. We're going to call it the Novice 10. It's a 10 meter double side band transceiver. Okay, let's try a couple microphones into this. No amplification. It's just a microphone driving the balance modulator directly. First mic I'm going to try is a crystal mic. It's uh, one of those little crystal or ceramic mics from the 50s. It's actually a lapel mic. Look, it has a little clip. Test one, two, three, four. Hello, hello, hello. So, yeah, I'm getting audio, but it's very low. I would say you'd need one transistor to bring that up to the point where it would modulate it. So that's just a simple crystal mic. Next, let's try one of those old computer mics like you've got in your junk box. Little Electrat mic. Uh, I'm powering that off the 5-volt regulator, and I think I got like a 1.5K resistor. One, two, three, four. Hello, test one, two. Wow, the Electret's actually got enough output. It's uh, it's modulating it directly. One, two, three, four, five. Let's try it in upper sideband. 
Test one, two, three, four, five. Hello, test. Yeah, this is just an electret. Let's try another one. Ooh, this is a fancy uh, electret mic from the 80s, 90s. Test one, two, three, four, five. Hello, test. Test one, two, three, four, five. Hello, test. Hello, test. Hello, test. So there you go. You really don't need much to modulate this thing. Now, of course, we have to develop a linear power amplifier to take our weak modulator up to the 2 or 3 watt level. But uh, let's leave that for now and talk about the block diagram of the system and specifically the receiver portion. So we're trying to use the same oscillator for both transmit and receive and a common mixer or a common modulator for both the transmit and the receive. This is a direct conversion transceiver. Now, how we figure out the TR or transmit to receive switching is coming up. I haven't got it solved. I'm thinking about it. But for now, let's just concentrate on the receive chain. And uh, specifically, uh, we're going to need to come through the PA filter I'd like to have the benefit of the PA filter on the receive chain. And then we come down through a preamplifier of some kind into the mixer, uh, which is the demodulator in this case, and then out of the demodulator into the audio amplifier and out the speaker. I've got two stages shown. I'm not sure if it's going to be a transistor pre uh, preceding an LM386 or if I'm going to have a, a final amplifier that has enough gain that it can do it all in one stage. But we do know that on 10 meters we need a little extra gain. We're going to get that with an RF preamplifier and a little more gain on the audio. So looking at the schematic, we can see that uh, it's four transistors already. Two are devoted to the local oscillator and then the two diode modulator, demodulator, and then we have two transistors in the preamplifier. Now that preamplifier is very interesting. It's a common base amplifier followed by an emitter follower. Why common base? Well, I wanted to use common base because it gives a low impedance input and the gain is defined purely by the amount of impedance you put in the collector. In this case, I'm using a tuned circuit and that tuned circuit is going to have a high enough impedance that this thing's going to have a lot of gain. In fact, I measured the gain of the amplifier at over 30 dB. Now we could use a normal high performance RF chain, possibly a double or triple tuned circuit, followed by a high feedback, high current drain, high IP3 amplifier uh, going into a, a high level double balanced mixer stage and now we're starting to look at high performance techniques. I wanted to avoid high performance techniques with this because I wanted to save current and I wanted to use more generic parts. So we're getting away with ordinary transistors and ordinary diodes and simple uh, toroid type transformers. The penalty is we might have some breakthrough. We might have some CB interference we might have some shortwave interference. We might have some broadcast interference coming in. And the way I would like to try to fight that is by the use of wave traps, specifically wave traps on the front of the receiver before the RF amplifier, and by using a good RF gain control right up front. That's a technique that's well known to you guys already. By putting a 1 or a 5K potentiometer up front, you keep the bad stuff from getting in and upsetting the circuitry and rectifying and getting AM demodulation and so on. So we're going to use some of those tricks rather than using a high performance current hog type design. These are some random inductors out of some switching power supplies like ATX power supplies. I've removed the turns off one of these pieces of ferrite and I just want to see if I uh, wound some of that tri-filer 
wire around that rod in just a solenoid fashion, would that make a transformer and could I get a null out of it? I'm just too poor to afford a toroid of any kind. I just want to use this surplus ferrite and see if I can make a transformer. So there it is. I've wound seven turns of the trifolier wire right around the ferrite rod. Let's uh, tie the ends together and make it into a transformer. Okay, so I've got the worst of both worlds now. I have the solenoid wound transformer and I have ordinary 1N914 diodes in place of the shock keys and I, uh, the potentiometer is almost way over because I didn't match the diodes at all. Uh, so these are not well matched diodes and also the trimmer is almost maxed out. So, uh, But I just wanted to show that you can do a poor man special here with just 1N914 or 4148 diodes and just some random ferrite off an ATX power supply with a solenoid wine, no fancy toroids. So I wanted to have a little bit of gain in front of the mixer on the receive end. So I built a low noise preamplifier. This low noise preamplifier uh, is basically a 50 ohm input amplifier and it's a 50 ohm output amplifier. Now it's not your standard high feedback circuit that we're all used to using. Uh, this is a little bit novel. It's a common base preamp and uh, after the common base preamp I have a tuned circuit on the collector and then it goes into an emitter follower on the output. So it's two transistors but I'm getting all of the gain in one uh, 2222 uh, common base amplifier. Now to preserve the gain of the common base amplifier it requires the emitter follower on the output. So it's a cascade of two transistors I'm getting about 35 dB of gain and it's quite strong. It's quite a nice amplifier. Low input impedance and low noise figure because it's a common base type amplifier. Take a look at the waveform as I sweep it. Right now I'm at uh, 28 and a half megahertz. I'm going to go up to 30 megahertz. Okay, here's 35 megahertz. It's almost gone. So I am taking advantage of the output filter of the transmitter the output filter of the transmitter is in line before the preamp and I get all the benefits of that uh, uh, five pole filter. Then I go into the common base amp and then there is a separate tuned circuit in between the two transistors. And that's what gives me this really nice selectivity. I get some beautiful selectivity now if I go down in frequency, of course, it drops off quite rapidly too. I'm down to 24 megahertz now. And uh, you want to have some selectivity there because, you know, this is going to be wide open. You don't want it to pick up AM radio stations and strong shortwave stations. You want to pick up the 10 meter band. Now there's quite a bit of noise on 10. But I'm going to put the amplifier in line so you can hear it. And this attached to the output. So this is with the amplifier and you can see it's come up drastically. Okay, I'm going to put 20 dB in the output of the preamp. 20 dB. So I now have a 20 dB pad in the output of the preamplifier between it and the receiver.
Well, thank you very much. I see we worked in July of last year, and I don't know, I don't have any particular comment as to what it was, but uh, I'm sorry, in June, June 24th of last year. So good to hear you again. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Take care in Louisiana, 73. 73. Thanks for picking me up. I hope you have a good afternoon. Norway, Charlie 6 Radio. Kilo, Charlie 0, Japan Radio. Kilo, Kilo. Okay, so I think the preamp is really doing a great job. Um, and I just wanted to try it on a receiver. So again, this is the preamp with the 20 dB pad. Okay, we'll take the 20 dB pad out. Okay, I have an unstable oscillator, of course, I'm just testing. So I just put the two boards together, the preamp and the, basically the exciter and receiver, all, all in one. Tuning it by my hand here. So I'm tuning it just with my hand here. Once we get a stable oscillator, we'll be all set. This theremin effect of uh, tuning with my hand is fun. So the other question is, uh, now that I have a trap in line, how do we set the trap? Now, of course, you could use a generator, and you're simply tuning for minimum breakthrough on the CB band with the generator. But generally, uh, what I do is I just wait for the CB band to wake up, start to get the breakthrough signals, and then I use the tuning tool to adjust the trap. The trap is right here. It's in the base of the first amplifier stage. Okay, this is a CB signal. And now the trap is tuned. Again, off tune. And now the trap is tuned. So let me explain this setup. Basically, this was going to be a VXO controlled transceiver. That means we're taking a crystal and we're warping that crystal maybe 20 or 30 kilohertz if we're lucky. The problem with that is you're not going to hear any signals to do any testing or to evaluate the receiver. So instead of using a crystal like this, okay, I've replaced the crystal with a simple uh, red toroid, powdered iron toroid, and guess what? The oscillator doesn't care whether it's a crystal resonator or it's a, a toroid. So it oscillates merrily. Of course, uh, we're talking about a 2N2222 Colpitts oscillator operating at 28 megahertz. You can't imagine that would be very stable. I'm using a 1N4001 diode as a varactor, 
uh, instead of using my hand to tune it like I was earlier. So now I have a control where I can actually tune the receiver. That's what the VFO is all about. <laughs> so not a recommended VFO at 10 meters. It's a miracle after letting it warm up for a few minutes that I'm able to tune anything in. But it did show how sensitive the receiver was and that was the point. And it's just starting to wake up. Just starting to wake up. from Southern California for a couple of years, so I, I got pretty good at uh, setting. <laughs> Frequencies drift a little bit.